Hey guys, welcome to the Black Box Podcast, where we have conversations with key industry leaders to shed light on the inner workings of their respective industries. Today, we have two lawyers and respectively sneakerheads, Kenneth Anand and Jared Goldstein. Kenneth Anand is former general counsel and business development of Yeezy and currently founded his own fashion development agency, 380 Group. And Jared Goldstein is former complex, experienced sneaker reseller and currently legal counsel at Live Intent. The two lawyers have recently teamed up to make a new book called Sneaker Law, which is essentially the sneaker, the legal Bible of the sneaker industry. So Kenneth and Jared, thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your time. Nice to be here. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Of course. Um, So I would love to jump in with one, what essentially does sneaker law comprise of and what inclined you guys to make a book like this? Why did you feel like the industry needed this? Sure, I can uh, kick it off. I mean, sneaker law is exactly what you said. It's the Bible for the sneaker industry. Um, you know, although it's called sneaker law, it's not restricted only to legal aspects of the sneaker business. It's um, business as well. So um, we have chapters on many different facets of the business, including how to start your own sneaker business, um, you know, licensing, manufacturing, design. We have a beautiful design section that goes into how to become a sneaker designer. We have a section on reselling and counterfeits. And we have this uh, very robust collaboration se- section, which is beautiful. It's like this 60 page color, um, you know, history of all the beautiful c- collaborations that have come up in the sneaker business. And then, of course, we have the legal sections, which um, are most exciting to people because they just don't have access to the kind of knowledge that we're giving them. And you guys have actually taught some of this in actual law schools like Harvard, Miami, Brooklyn, right? How has it been received? Is that something that they feel like they are missing from their curriculums? Yeah, I mean, it's been amazing. Um, You know, we've uh, hit, as you mentioned, we just finished our first um, sneaker law course, an actual course at the University of Miami Law School. Um, We're gearing up for a couple more courses in the fall 2021 semester. Um, we've lectured at, I think about 15 schools, you know, just individually, just one-off lectures as well. Um, you know, we've had Harvard Law School, Howard, um, UNC, USC, Cardozo. We actually did this week, just to name a few. Um, and, uh, you know, the reception has been amazing. Um, you know, we've also had some guest speakers join on some of our classes. So we had Don C, uh, pull up, you know, in Harvard, we had a, a mock, uh, sneaker deal. And the students didn't know he was showing up. So we had a group that was representing Don and a couple other parties in the deal. And they just bugged out. It was crazy. Uh, We had Daniel Arsham uh, come to University of Miami Law School. It was the same situation. But that was actually in person. So it was funny. You know, one of the students was presenting at the time. And Daniel just popped up on the screen. And he was just, like, bugging out. Like, you know, he was was all over the place. It was really, (laughs) really funny. Um, but, you know, it's, it's really been an amazing reception. You know, what we're trying to do is we're trying, you know, we're teaching, we're not reinventing any wheel here. You know, we're teaching the same business and legal concepts that have been taught for years and years and years, but we're using, we're using sneakers as the vehicle and, you know, the students have just been receiving it, you know, so well, you know, they, they just think it's so cool and engaging, you know, the book um, is just really beautiful the way it looks obviously inside and out, um, you know, it's bred, after the, uh, the OG Jordan one, um, we have a shoelace as the, uh, the bookmark. It's full color images, you know, which you don't really see in textbooks, uh, foil stamping, emboss, deboss. Um, it's like a coffee table book too. So, you know, it's just, it's, it's really been overwhelming. You know, people have just been going crazy over it and we're really excited. Yeah, I think it's dope because I think we as sneakerheads and as business people know that the market has matured. And it continues to mature. Like you hit on, first of all, I have a lot to say right now, but I'm fucking pissed that I don't have this book. Like Savannah, I'm Savannah, Savannah, you so sold actually, yourself short. So actually, you worked on it. Burton helped on me get watch. Matt Half, Half Hill from Nice Kicks. To we'll get you a copy, bro. Don't <laughs> no, worry. I just don't yeah, understand. Yeah. Like she's like, yo, you got any contacts in the sneaker industry? I'm like, oh, DePaula, Half Hill, you know, a couple of NBA guys that are sneakerheads, but I can't get a book. Like Sorry, this is crazy I, to me. Oversight, and, oversight. And then, and then, so I'm pit, I'm doubly pissed about it. I was forgot I was pissed months ago. And this is just for bringing it all back, but. The, the chapters that you guys mentioned 
are things that Savannah and I, our producers talked about as topic points for today, because, you know, the idea of the resale business, right. The idea of collaborations. And there was a, there's a, there was a business piece this week that came out, right. I think it was Hardee's did a collaboration, uh, limited edition, right. Uh, the idea, the legal aspects, like you said, are important to understand, right. They, that stuff can maybe get dry, but, but to understand, and I, and I'll even add in a couple of other legal terms that are, that I've seen in Chinese sneaker deals that are not necessarily in Nike deals. Right. So I'd love to talk a little bit about that, but I think the first thing my mind gravitates to is this explosion of the resale business. And, you know, my first thought is where is the cap here? Right. Um, It is a multi-billion dollar resale business. Right. And before we get into like the consumerism and the culture of like, and the idea of bots and all that stuff for the floor, what's your like general disposition about the idea of using round numbers, a hundred dollar sneaker at retail costs you a thousand dollars. Right. I mean, I, I I don't know what the average is. I don't have the stats in front of me, but it's three to five X at minimum. Right. That you're paying. And then it depends on, you know, how, how exclusive the sneaker actually is. I have mixed feelings, but I'd love to hear the floor. This is for everybody. I, I'm not directing this at anybody specifically, but I'd love to hear the floor's opinion about that general thought. I'll let, uh, I'll, I'll let Jared speak to this because he's the reselling guru. I mean, he had a, a reselling business in college and, um, I'll let you take it away, bro. I mean, it really oh, depends on what... Do you with reselling sneakers? <laughs> yeah, you can't make it up. Um, <laughs> uh, I mean, it really depends on what, what POV you're looking at it from. Mm-hmm. I mean, from the brand's perspective, I mean, don't let them fool you as much as they try to act like they're against reselling. It's actually amazing for them. You know, it brings them a ton of brand, yep. you know... Yep. Exactly. Brand awareness, hype, makes you want to buy other products. Mm-hmm. And uh, consumers are constantly glued, you know, to their phones for the brands, you know, in, in anticipation, what's mm-hmm. dropping next. I mean, I still have like Twitter notifications enabled for Nike and there's like no need because of the sneakers app, but it's just been like that since like 2014 when I right. turned it on. Right. And it's just like, you know, everybody is just looking for what's next. And um, I mean, you know, what happened with the XVP and Nike's son, I mean, that's bringing a lot of attention to it now, um, you know, where the brands might have to start, you know, acknowledging it publicly. I mean, Nike at the time when that happened, it was like, I think it was the first time they ever publicly acknowledged bots outside of their you know, terms of service, right. you know, or their privacy policy. Um, so that's going to be interesting. I mean, I, you know, they're definitely not for bots, but it's, you know, that's really just cat and mouse game. You know, it's like, you know, you're Nike saying, you're, you're or not for bots. You're saying Nike's not for bots. Who's dead? Yeah. Okay. I would say Nike, you know, and, and the brands. I mean, you know. But I don't think they're uh, against bots. I think, sorry to interrupt, but I think no. that. You think they just say that because they have No, to? I think that driving the price up is good. Even though the money doesn't go in Nike's pocket, it's good for, like we said, the hype game, right? Like driving that price up to $1,000 makes that a primo purchase. Now you're not buying a Honda, you are buying a Lambo. And I think, and it's the bots that drive it. I mean, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a, it's a consumer who purchases it. Right. Or, or maybe even a better analogy than cars. It's now art. Now it, you drove it to a price where it's a collect, it's a collector's item art to be displayed. However you display your art. Right. And now the value of it can increase because we got it to this threshold. So I I agree with Jared here that I don't think they're like they're not uh, lobbying for bots, but they're also not lobbying against it because it helps the hype machine. I mean, it is the hype machine. It is artificial hype. And, you know, Jared, you, you said it depends on your POV. So that was a very lawyerly way of not answering the question. (laughs) <laughs> and, and the question was to get your POV actually like I, I like so answer this directly what is your POV on on the idea of for lack of a better word inflated pricing in the resale market yeah I mean I think it's great for the culture you know it's uh it brings height like we like we talked about um you know it, it allows 
you know, people to make money in this game and become entrepreneurs. I mean, that's what I did when I was in college. I learned great business skills doing it. Um, you know, it, it allowed platforms like StockX and, you know, Goat to come into the game, which also I think is great exposure just for the industry overall. Um, and it just makes it exciting. Like, you know, I'll, just, I'll like, give, the, I'll give the, the opposite point of view as someone who is more of a consumer when it comes to sneakers yeah. than a flipper. Um, I have paid 3x, 5x for certain sneakers and begrudgingly, but you know, I gotta have that, I gotta have that flame on my feet. Mm -hmm. Um, it's also frustrating when kids can't get, uh, Playstations or Xboxes at Christmas time. Like, you know, there, there's definitely a difficult side to it and a frustrating side to it. But I also point out that the hype game is really, um, and I heard this stat recently, I can't verify it's, if, if it's completely accurate, but I heard that the hype game is only about 15% of the actual business of these brands, yeah. right? So, so we, like, this is the most publicized, the most hyped, and the most, um, you, know, uh, you know, heavily salivated over aspect of the game, but it's really just scratching the surface of these companies' bottom lines, and they're going to be fine you know, without that, you know, because they're still selling these GR yeah, pairs. Yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. I, yeah, agreed, Kenneth. And what you guys, yeah. the stuff that we talked about in all of our production meetings, the mm -hmm. idea of entrepreneurship, because this market is so healthy, financially healthy, right? Jared said he had a business flipping sneakers, right? There's no difference between flipping sneakers and flipping houses, right? It's a healthy business. True. Business, right. And, but then to your point, Kenneth, and this is stuff we talked about um, internally, sorry consumerism like the consumer gets hurt right and what i mean by hurt is now they got to pay that three to five x now if you can afford it you can afford it that's life right like but the but consumer if you can't afford it you shouldn't be buying it well if you well if you can afford the 200 dollars or the 150 dollars sneaker now i now that that person can't afford the 750 dollars sneaker but that's you, where the consumer gets hurt but do you do you really need the sneaker because to your point at that point it's art right and art is supposed to be an asset and at this point yes sneakers are considered an emerging asset class um but if it appreciates and it's out of your budget like you shouldn't you should okay so so okay Okay, so now like my thought is this. For something no, no, you did. You did set me up for something. But I, it's interesting that you have that point of view mm -hmm. because I would think you would want access to that fire at 150. Okay, so here, here's the other part of it, right? Jared said it's good for the culture. The hype game's good for the culture. We get the PR. Mm -hmm. But my counter to that is that kid who actually is setting the culture, he don't get a chance. Like- yeah, but, but but look, I think I think kids kids are always gonna get fly no matter what, right? And like right. even if they can't buy the Travis Scott ones, they're gonna find a way to look fly and set the culture, right? So yeah. so I like it's like saying it's like saying every kid should buy Louis Vuitton. Like, no, they're gonna find something else fly to make as dope as that and we're all gonna like look at them and be like right, yo how, you get that's you got, how we dapper were... dan came about right like that's, yeah. that is the culture i have like, no idea who dapper dan is oh, but that's gosh. fine um <laughs> i was gonna you let are that not go. the culture <laughs> yeah i i yo just so we're super clear on all of this i wore the most because we were good and so you guys know a little bit i geek out on this subject like this is a same my first ever job in sports was Slam Magazine, 1999. So talk about like a publication that was like embracing the sneaker culture way before. Yeah. We're talking print, not dot com. Nobody even a in my magazine. Fuck, like nobody <laughs> in my apartment even had a computer. Like we're reading books and magazines and newspapers. Yeah. Magazine, right? Slam Magazine. I have, I will. I became a sneakerhead when I was like. 13 like you know i was on the basketball team i start seeing oh shit everyone's wearing dope like now i gotta wear dope shit and you know i come from an immigrant household so my mom was like one sneaker a year like to convince yeah. her to give me two sneakers one for the on court one for the off court was that was the battle of my life like like calculus yeah. got nothing on mom dukes right that. nothing on mom <laughs> and then like you know you have to clean it and make sure because you're not getting that third sneaker mm -hmm. so i was sne sneakerhead early on then i got i was lucky enough to get a job it, as a teenager working for slam and now really in the mix. Right. And I was lucky enough to wear the right size. Cause then I was getting all the samples. Right. Um, and then I, you know, matured in my career and stuck with it, like worked at Excel and did sneaker deals. 
right? So I, this is like something I really, really, really embrace. <sighs> Having said all of that, it is really frustrating to me. So I have a mix. So my POV on my own question is, I agree with the capitalism. I'm a capitalist. I struggle with the idea. Although Kenneth made the right point, which is they're going to always figure out. The, the kids are always going to figure out how to shape the culture. So that's the right point. That makes me feel better. But I struggle with the idea of like, you, know, you got to pay this much just to be in the game. Like, that's crazy to me. Um, so limited edition, hard pivot, Kobe Bryant. Yeah. Kobe Bryant. What do you guys, what's your perspective on what happened with the deal running out with the Bryant estate deciding not to renew with there's little information out there. I spoke to someone at Nike last night that specifically works on Kobe. So I have a wow. little bit of perspective, but not a ton, a little bit. Um, Cause he or she, I will not reveal sources did not like was not involved in the negotiation part of it, but what's your perspective on what happened? So uh, yeah, I'll kick it off. I mean, First of all, we all know it didn't work out, right? So what does that mean? When, a, when an extension isn't agreed to and the parties can't come to terms on, on an extension of an already existing deal, which everybody thinks is going great, there's obviously something that's not going great, right? Otherwise, if everything was hunky-dory and like the parties were having a great time making tons of money- extended a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Facts, facts. So something's not going right. Now we know that Vanessa and even Kobe before he passed away, um, was vocal about the fact that they wanted wider distribution, right? So that, that's their biggest gripe. They wanted wider distribution. Maybe they wanted distribution akin to LeBron, akin to Jordan. Maybe Kobe wasn't as widely distributed. I don't know the numbers on the distribution for Kobe's, but I do know that they're harder to get your hands on than a pair of LeBrons or a pair of Jordans, mm -hmm. um, especially in his retirement, you know? And so I think they already had some beef with that. I think they were looking for a similar deal akin to Jordan and, and, and LeBron and maybe his sneakers weren't as popular and maybe they were saying, OK, well, our ability to create new silhouettes is somewhat limited. You know, um, there could be many workings of it, but whatever whatever the case was, it didn't work out. And what does that mean? You know, now that it you know, now that it hasn't worked out, what does that mean? What does that mean for. Go ahead. What's your speculation? Well, Kenneth? I think really quick. Yeah. I think it's what's interesting about it is that Nike has lifelong partnerships with Michael Jordan and LeBron James, who came after Kobe and Kobe didn't have a lifelong partnership. Vanessa specifically said she was looking to form a lifelong partnership. And it was obvious that that the Kobe's were doing well, because currently on the court, I think it's 103 basketball players wear Kobe's and the next runner up after that are the Kyrie's and it's only 57 players. That we're yes, the correct. And I, and I think it does very well. I think they do very well as a performance shoe. In fact, Kobe was always trying to retool his shoes. That's why they call them pro tros, right? They're not retros. They're pro tros because he upgraded the performance of, of his re-releases to match, you know, the way the game has changed. And so they're great on the court shoes. Now, does that translate into like widespread casual sneaker wearing? I don't know. Like I, I've, I only own one pair of Kobe's myself. I got the new Grinches and they went up in value like almost double since this announcement. Right, right. So, right, so I, I, I'm, this is speculation. I, I've worn Kobe's. They are great performance shoes. That's not speculation. I think that what I'm speculating is this. I think they drew, <laughs> <laughs> they're great performance shoes. They are. I, I, I think Kenneth is on to something. Like maybe there was internal auditing being done where it's like if we release this at the level of lebron the, the numbers we might not sell as much right so maybe keeping it a limit at you know you're almost controlling the market by and making it feel exclusive right it's so hard to get kobe's it's so hard to get kobe's yet one fourth or one fifth of the league is wearing kobe's right so like yo i really want to be devin booker but shit i can't get a hold of these you're creating the market the demand that way right like we did that with wade when we launched Way of Wade in 2012, every time we did a U.S. release, so China's different, and we can get to China later in the conversation, but every time we did a U.S. release, we would do like this custom color and limited run. That's it in the U.S. So we drive up the market, one, sure. price-wise, so that we could justify <clears throat> charging 200 bucks, 
Um, and that's really, this is 2012, 2013 when I really got like onto the resale game. Like I'm like, I couldn't get a pair. I remember Yo, I'm, I'm from Miami. Me. I'm a big heat fan. So. Just called me, bro. <laughs> I had stocks. I'm just not like greedy. I never resold them. I just gave them away. But like we drove up the market to where we could justify 200 bucks. And then um, it felt like when you, when you only have a thousand sneakers, which is not a lot of sneakers and you sell out over a weekend, you feel good. You feel like, yo, I sold out. You don't mm-hmm. say I sold out only a thousand. You say I sold out. Sure. So I obviously it's a larger scale with Kobe, but I think some of that is the marketing. Be- I, this is speculation. I'm, this is not, this is how I would play it mm-hmm. if I were Nike. And but so- also, but also let me just throw this out there. Is it that every NBA player is wearing Kobe's because they're a superior performance shoe or is it out of respect because he passed away last year? Combination. Definitely a combination, right? Like, yeah. you know, DeMar DeRozan said, I'm never wearing anything else. I'm wearing Kobe. I, Kobe was my idol. He died, all that stuff. Like, but it's a combination, right, mm-hmm. Kenneth? It, and, and those guys either have a real deal, like Devin Booker, <clears throat> or not a real deal, meaning like they get six figures, like Bradley Beal, or they just straight getting merch. That's it. Like they're not getting, and so if I got a hundred grand worth of merch, again, using round numbers and I'm the backup point guard for the Memphis Grizzlies, all right, give me a bunch, give me a hundred grand worth of Kobe, right? Like, I, like, cause it's a good performance shoe, right? So, sure. and it looks, honestly, it looks fire if we're being honest, Still. Like, right? The, I actually think the, the LeBrons pro- progressively get better, but they're big, like they're heavy. They're big. Yeah. Yeah. It's not, a clunky shoe. It's a right, clunky shoe. Right. Not to spend too much. I don't know if you guys are hoopers, but not to spend too much time on hoops. Like, you know, I don't want to wear heavy shoes. I'm already slow. No, no, no. Like, I'm going to wear two, two, like, two different know. style players. So they just built it for them, you know? Right, right. right. A different style of brands. But, but you you made right. a good point on the different tiers of type of um, partnerships and deals that players could have. And I would love to, because I'm I'm kind of like coming into, into this sneaker deal business because I think we mentioned this on one of our podcasts, but in specifically in sports, at least in basketball, the biggest contract besides the one you're making with the team is the shoe deal. It's always the shoe deal. Yep. It's always the shoe deal. Yep. So I would love to know, and I think you guys talk about this in your book from a lawyer perspective on whether it's like trade secrets, negotiation terms, and things you should know going in from your perspective. And then also Burton, from your perspective as a salesperson in between the lawyers and the shoe company and the, and the athlete. Lawyers can always go first. (laughs) Yeah. So as you mentioned in our book, we have a chapter dedicated to the art of the sneaker deals, what we call it, which is solely, you know, solely for sneaker deals and the deal terms that are included in those agreements. Um, And our goal there was to empower the designer, the collaborator, the endorser, athlete, sometimes even the, you know, also the brand, because, you know, we both, we show both sides of the coin as well, or anyone else, you know, looking to enter into a deal. And we arm you with essential knowledge um, about these deals and how they're structured and what to negotiate with respect to those terms. Um, and first and foremost, intellectual property. So, you know, whether it's a license, a collab, an endorsement. Well, let's go through some of the, the, the deals. So you, have, you can have a license deal. You can have a collab, an endorsement, influencer deal, promotions, advertisements. And there's also others. Um, so no matter what the deal is, you know, trademarks, copyrights, patents, they all have to be considered. Um, IP ownership, you know, who's going to own any of the IP uh, that's created in association with the deal? Um, will it be any licensing of IP? So with Kobe, um, it was reported that he, his estate owns, you know, some of those trademarks. So in that deal, it would be interesting to know, you know, how, how those terms looked in terms of the license, you know, what the territory was, yeah. um, whether it was exclusive, was it assignable, is it limited or in perpetuity, meaning forever? Um, what the scope is. So, you know, overall, what can the IP be used for? Um, You know, there's been a lot of speculation on whether Nike can release those in the future. Um, And, you know, it's impossible to say unless we actually see, you know, see the deal, but those terms are, are, you know, what you would look for. Um, In addition, intellect, yeah, go ahead. Kobe stuff? Like, are people reaching out to you for your opinion about the Kobe stuff? Are people asking asking on it? Because, Jared, all those things you just mentioned are all things that are valid and really interesting to see how it'll play out and could be interesting a year from now, two years from now. Right. Like, like you said, 
five years from now, like, and all things I didn't think about in the last 48 hours. And these are all, and, and my experience with Nike, I love Nike. I don't want to come off like I don't love Nike. I love Nike. Um, my experience with them has always been, here's the contract. Deal points are negotiable, but everything else, not negotiable. Yeah. So yeah, that's always been my experience with them. And maybe I'd never had the opportunity to have the leverage of what LeBron has and what Kobe has, right? Like there, there's le- different leverage points, right? When you're negotiating with certain. Yeah. Talents. And that's, and that's kind of what I want to touch on. Like what level do you necessarily have to be on in order to own your own intellectual property or have certain licensing? Because I mean, we saw, we saw it happen with Kawhi and Nike where yeah. there was a huge problem with intellectual property. Was that on his lawyers? Was it on Nike? Like I, I so I would argue, I'm not trying to dodge your question at all, but I'm going to give you an answer that's probably So you're dodging vague. my question. No, vague. Because I, I, <laughs> an, I would say the answer is like, it. Ju- you're asking me what level do you have to be on? I think it just depends. It depends on, how do I say this the right way? How badly does Nike want you, right? Like, you know, LeBron created all his leverage because of, his on-court performance first and foremost and everything else that comes off the court with him, including the content, including building an empire, including being at the front lines of the social justice conversation. But Kawhi apparently had leverage and he just didn't know about no, it until didn't. they produced well, it. Well, I'll, I'll explain what happened with Kawhi. I mean, Kawhi signed with Nike first yeah. and for whatever reason, the partnership was not successful, but the two of them created his logo together. So they jointly own the rights to that logo. Yeah. So when he went to New Balance and he tried to use the glove, they were like, no, 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 we own this. Right. You know, or at least we own part of it. And it's, right. you know, no I don't, I don't. Is when you do it with us and now that we're not with us, it's basically a dead logo. But I'm, Savannah, like he didn't have much because he, as good as he was. I mean, he sued and won, didn't he? Not to use it. He, I think he, I, no, think, I, I don't think, I don't think he can use it anymore. And I don't think he's using the glove at New Balance. He's not. He's not. Right. So I, I didn't think, I didn't think it was that great a mark to begin with, but that's, you know. Yeah. <laughs> but so, but sometimes you just fall in love with, your logo. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, it's one guy's. Like he's he's got he's got big hands. Okay, right. so that's your logo. I mean, <laughs> right. right. But, but I, to you know, scenario, the reason he didn't have leverage is as good as he was, he's not LeBron, like marketing wise, right? Like, it, it's there. That's the leverage I'm talking about. It's like, it's like the elite of the elite have leverage with Nike. Everybody else, you better play ball. Like they they could prop you up. They they can they they make KD look amazing. His sneakers are amazing. Uh, marketing's amazing. All that stuff. They can prop you up, but you don't have leverage over the evil empire, right? Like that's. Okay, oh, I so, never had that. Okay, so let's say let's say I don't let's say I have a great player and I don't want to go to Nike. You're saying that can my player make more money and have more intellectual property if we go to like a Li Ning or something like that? Well, uh, that's what Wade did eventually, right? Like mm. Wade was on the back nine of his career. And this was a lifetime opportunity for him that, you know, th- to be frank, when the Converse deal ran out for Wade, nothing went well for him after that. Like the Jordan stuff didn't go well. Like they couldn't sell a shoe for him. He, he, he and his team have very specific strategies. So they're not the easiest to work with all the time. Like he's doing deals with, mcdavid while he has a jordan deal that's not going to sit well with nike um so he had one opportunity yeah it's very it's very difficult for especially in nike's eyes for you to as a celebrity as an athlete for you to go to another brand and then come back or even be at another brand and then join them like they don't want that conversation they want to be the only ones yeah and, and kobe overcame that right with the, he did with adidas he's one of the few that overcame it right but you're 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 dead on kenneth like mm. they don't want they they've and and the marketing machine is efficient so they have they have their leverage right like um so anyways again hard pivot customization do we think wow, very hard pivot yeah sorry because <laughs> here's, here's the issue, here's the issue. <laughs> I, 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 if, if, I should have said this at the top of the show like there are so many deep rabbit holes we can go down. So many. Like, and we love this. We love this. Do we, do we, is this a six part series or a one hour? Like, <laughs> right. like, that's why I'm hard pivoting. You know, it might be a case where we get you guys on or, or, or do 
multiple episodes, but like there were so many things we've talked about that I wanted to talk with you guys uh, about. I told you guys, I was like, Burton's very excited to have this conversation. Hi, hi. I, like, I, like, I like this industry. <laughs> Funny part is I, my, at my peak, I had 383 sneakers. At my peak. That's pretty good. Nice culture. And you live in New York City. Like, do you Yo, even it have was this? Insane. I was living in a, the... <laughs> no, I was living in a two bedroom in the East Village. And I just had like a come to, I'm, I'm not Christian, a come to Ganesh moment where I was like, <laughs> I, I got way too many sneakers. Like, this is not healthy. I have more sneakers than days of the year. All right, wait, real quick. How many sneakers do you guys have? I'm about 225. I would say I have 75 to 100, but not by choice. My wife does not let me uh, house all these sneakers in this uh, NYC apartment. Yep. So no, I'm, now I'm yeah, not. Everyone's in for. Not me, not, not me. I'm at 24 now. So that's the thing. What? My come to Ganesh moment was like, this is too much. This is unhealthy. I was feeling stressed about sneakers. Like, oh, it's dirty. Like, I don't want that in my life. So now I now it's 24 hard cap. So every time I get, I haven't bought sneakers in 20 years. If somebody gives me sneakers, then I. What are you rocking there? What do you got there? Oh. <laughs> oh God. I am so. Because we were having this conversation, I purposely went out of my way. There's a Chinese sneaker brand that is trying to sign a. I won't name the brand. They're trying to sign an NBA player this summer, and they sent me a bunch of pairs to like wear test and give them feedback on. And this is the only one that I think was like like, from a style standpoint, I liked it. What's the feedback? Oh, it's fucking garbage. <laughs> it hurts my feet. <laughs> like my foot is, this is the first time I'm wearing these sneakers. I took them out of the box for this show. My feet hurt so much. I thought it, I couldn't see it. I thought it was the pump Omni light. It looked like no, that for a minute. No, minute. Yeah. And it's a, it's a nice rip off of that, but like, poof, it's garbage. It looks like a Jordan eight as well from the front. Like with the, with the, um, yeah, the, the tongue. tongue. Yeah. 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 Uh, they're probably ripping off the designers are probably ripping off like a little bit of hair a little bit of hair like that's probably what they're doing but the it, it is not a good product um so i'm now at 24 hard cap like it's impressive yeah because 24 seconds in the shot clock i'm like fuck this every time i get a sneaker i give i give is that why you have 24 yeah that's how i picked the number yeah also kobe right kobe well, i didn't but it worked out that way like yeah if i could in go back it'd be 23 because i love lebron lebron's my guy um all right customization mosh the chef all this stuff what is any of that customization is basically like <laughs> yeah. so mosh, mosh the chef i, I know customization yeah, yeah but mosh, mosh is one of the the leading sneaker artists in the game right mm. like lebron will send him a pair of sneakers he'll paint on them send it back so is something like that similar to what happened with the whole lil nas x satan shoe where he had like a creative agency make yes. you is that, yeah, is similar. that really so, cut, so a customization versus a bootleg, a custom, a customization is when you buy the actual sneaker mm -hmm. and then you transform it in your lab, in your studio, whatever, and then you sell it for more or less same price, whatever you do. Um, that's a customization. A bootleg is when you get a, a product that is not manufactured legitimately in a Nike or in another brand's factory, and then you make it your own in some other way. So that's the Warren Lotus example. That's the, you know, the, the dunk with the Freddy Krueger on it or the dunks with the Statue of Liberty on it, whatever, you know, those are bootleg. That is the bootleg market. I don't follow that market at all. Like, is it bad? Is Nike trying to kill everything out there? That's Wait, also, I, I have a quick question before, before we move on from that. So technically, if Lil Nas X bought the shoes from Nike and had it customized, would they not have been able to sue? I mean, it's a, a very interesting case and it's settled. Um, but Nike was just really, you know, they were trying to save face because there was a lot of consumer confusion that was out there. They thought that Nike had some involvement with it. And, um, you know, if you're a sneakerhead, you, you most likely knew that Nike had nothing to do with it. But if you're talking like middle America, you're really who makes up most of Nike's market share. You know, people who are buying running shoes and apparel, Yep. And, you know, they're, they're going to Twitter and they're seeing all this craziness about, you know, the mischief sneaker thinking that it's Nike and they were, you know, playing the boycott. Nike had to set the record straight. So, yeah. you know, that's why they sued. But I think they had a, a really strong trademark dilution claim, which, um, right. you know, 
they injected, um, you know, human blood into the air bubble. There was safe imagery all over the sneaker. Um, they could argue that there was unfavorable views that, you know, that Nike, that, you know, resulted as a, you know, due to the sneaker. So they had to defend themselves and that's what they did. And, um, you know, it settled and they, um, agreed to have uh, mischief offer, um, recalls the sneakers to, to buy, buy them back. But I think Nike at the end of the day was just trying to set the record straight, you know, that they had nothing to do with it. That's controversial. I forgot what the law is. Maybe Jared, you know, it off the top of your head, but like if I buy a pair of Nike's, and customize it, like paint, have mosh paint on it. Let's say I buy a hundred dollar pair, I pay mosh another two hundred bucks, and I sell them for five hundred. I can do that all day long. Yeah, that's not it's called. Good. It's called the yeah. first sale doctrine. Right, right, exactly. That's what it's called. Yep. Mm. All right, Kenneth. All right, right. see with the Jared. Literally I, a lawyer. I know, I know. But I, I, I should have said it to for Kenneth and Jared. Sorry. Yes. That's no, right. no, no, no. You know, we're a team. Bro. Like, customize paint it. I can resell that Mercedes. Fair. Right. I buy Mercedes. Yeah. Custom Absolutely. Paint. Right. 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 So, but I think what Jared was mentioning with the Lil Nas, and I didn't follow it closely, like that stuff was weird to me. Um, <laughs> like, I'm, I'm done listening to it. So, um, you didn't cop? You didn't buy a pair? No. They're not one of your 24? No, definitely not. <laughs> the whole thing was weird to me. It was weird. I didn't even follow the story because I just well, I had no idea. Um, but yeah, I think what Jared is mentioning is like, detriment to the brand that's yes. what yeah. right like that's well, what i actually so i looked at at the lawsuit and it was like one of it was like copyright infringement and then another one was detriment to the brand so that's why i asked if it was specifically because they bought it and i'm sorry specifically because they made it as if they bought it from nike but it seems like they would have still had a case, even if they did buy the shoes and, and customize it, because it was still a detriment to the brand, to the case where people were boycotting Nike. Right. I think that's Jared's point, right? Yeah. The, the mother of three in Iowa is like, yes. okay, we're buying, we're buying Reebok now. We're not buying yeah, Nike 100%. anymore. Yeah, 100%. Right. So, so they had a case. Right, way. right. That's Got where it. the detriment to the brand comes in, right? Because it makes sense. Uh, okay. So do, do we like, do we not like customization? Do we think it's bad for the market? Do any of us? I don't customize, but anyone, don't, anyone here, I don't, I've never bought a customized shoe or do, like, do you guys, have you ever customized a shoe? I have I not. Mean, I, I, I like it. Yeah. Yeah. I like it too. It's, I think it's great for the culture. Um, you know, when we were in Miami teaching the course, we actually got invited to this huge operation. It's called the cobblers in Miami and they have a whole custom department. They refurbish sneakers. Um, and it's just like this crazy factor that's going on. And, you know, we have a lot of supporters from the custom um, community of, of our book, you know, um, but I think it's great. And uh, there's a lot of really cool things that happen from it. And there's also been, you know, times when customizers work for these brands. I mean, look at John Biger. He right. was, you know, misplacing checks for Nike on, you know, his versions of Nike um, on Air Force Ones. And then he went on to work with them. I, you know, he worked on the Darrell Riva sneaker and I think some other things as well. So I think it's great exposure for the brands. Yeah, I think I think it's the easiest entree into the sneaker game for designers, right? Like it's like tier one. You know, you want to be a sneaker designer, first try your hand at like switching out uppers with new materials, colors, do your own thing. It's like a DIY project for sneaker designers. And if you cripple that, then like where do the future designers come from? I feel like. And, and, and what I said earlier in the show is the maturation of this uh, business, right? Mm -hmm. The idea that there's design schools, right? Like back in the day, it was like, I'm good at art. Let me get an internship with Nike if I can get lucky. And then, oh shit, all of a sudden I'm a designer and blah, blah. Now you go to design school at, when you're 18 and you learn how to make a sneaker. Like that's how much the, the business they, is mature. Do, do they teach these types of things in fashion schools? Like some. some. Yeah, it's, some. It's, 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 yeah. Not to promo your book too much, but that's where your book's going to go eventually, right? Now yeah. you guys who's a 1L, who's like, oh shit, I could take this as a 2L and really learn about this business and maybe one day be the general counsel for Adidas or whatever. So like there's, the, the market is growing, right? And that-, yeah. that you know, But also just as important as to the law student, like it is to the designer. And for example, our book is now required reading at Parsons for the fall of 2021. Yeah. And every, gra every graduating senior- will be looking at our book and saying, okay, well, this is what I need to arm myself with when I'm out in the real world and I have to do a deal. You know, it doesn't matter whether you're a sneaker head or a sneaker designer, you should know this stuff. Yeah. That, yeah. That's dope. I have a funny story. Uh, I think I was in the second grade and I took, I had a pair of all white air force ones. And at the time, like in the music videos and everything and hip hop, 
Like they were wearing like Louis, Louis custom Air Forces and Gucci custom Air Forces. So I took my mom's Gucci bucket hat. Oh, and just going cut it up. I know where this is road. Yeah, yeah, I love this stuff. Uh, I cut it up and it ended up turning out terribly. Of course. Uh, for the sneaker and for, you know, my next two weeks because I was grounded. But uh, that was my only um, venture into sneaker customization. Now I just report on it and write about it. But, you know. I, Probably I, traumatized. I never, <laughs> I never customized, but my best, my move was in third grade. Where the fourth? I guess it was fourth grade. I really, I really wanted the Ewings, like the, yeah. you know what I'm saying the Patrick Ewing joints. Wow, those are old school. I'm old. This is what happened. No, but I actually, I, I know about it. So. so, but again, my mom's like, you know, we were middle class. It's not like they couldn't have got me the sneakers, but my mom's not gonna spend more than this is like she's not spending more than twenty dollars i was about to say not, my, my mom's not spending triple digits at oh all. my mom wasn't spend too. 50 bucks like nah that's not how this works you can pick whatever you want but in this budget and so and on you know, and on the real i'm not ashamed to say this like we used to buy our sneakers before school start you know in the fall before school yeah, you started have, you have school shopping yeah you go school shopping we used to buy the payless like that's where I got my sneakers. So I, I, was like, I went Yo. to I went to Skechers and I got so made fun of, which yeah. is why I'm like low key sneaker. Um, <laughs> we all have like probably a story we all have like a story. That. So Kenneth, you got to tell. We all got to go around. I, yeah, I so, got one. The, the way it netted out was, I was mad stressed because I'm like twenty dollars. What am I gonna get in here that I'm not gonna get killed for? And it was I ended up getting. They had these New York like the New York Knicks licensed out their sneakers to pay less I think and it I was like black this. and orange <laughs> and blue and it said like and it was real it wasn't like the bootleg shit it was like the real license i'm like oh what's this joint and it was black which i liked so i got those and i was a little nervous on day one because i'm like <laughs> yo i don't have the ewings i'm this can go either way this is like mm -hmm. there's a real test of like is this shit hot? i thought it was hot so this I'm is like, really how sneakers work too yeah. like it's such and a i walk and they, i was totally the, I was the man. They were like, yo, how'd you get those New York Knicks? <laughs> I was like, oh. I was like, yo, I was mad. Side relief. <laughs> yo, I was crazy stressed about it. But what's yours? Um, okay, so I don't even remember what type what type of sneakers they were, but I remember they looked like these Air Jordans that just got released. And it was in the Nike store. So I figured I figured I would be good because they look they look kind of like the sneaker, but it's still from Nike. So it's official. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not Skechers. Right. So I walk, I walk into, I remember it was Jim actually. And, <laughs> and it, this is like the first time I have like my Nike, my Nike sneakers on. And like, how old are you? Or what grade are you? In? I was, I was, I was in high school. So okay. I think it was like my freshman year. It okay. was my freshman year. And, and the guys from across the gym, they're like, yo, Sav has some new Jordans. What? That's crazy. And they're like, they run across the gym oh, and God. they see it's not the Jordan. So, oh, so then I'm like the laughing side. They're like, oh, shit, they're not even the oh, Jordans. Oh, my God, that's crazy. So then, yes. And, the, and then I don't think I was ever really, I think I had to just like wait until I can like work and save to actually yeah, no i i never got another nike sneaker that wasn't like the this nike is what bothers sneaker. me about the infl that's fair. inflation right but like, it's like i was i'm fine at the end of the day like, oh no don't doubt get me wrong and I, I still i kenneth definitely made me feel better when he said like they're gonna figure they're gonna it gonna out find a way. Yeah, yeah they're gonna figure yeah. it they look yeah. at me now you know, yeah, yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> all right so what's your <laughs> kenneth give us your story then i want to get back in the uh, all right so two two quick ones my parents bought me the 180 barkley forces when i was in i think fifth grade yep. and they thought my feet were still growing quite a bit so um no no maybe this was eighth grade but my my feet were still growing they thought so they bought me a size 12 and i'm a size 11 to this day right so i was rocking clown shoes like all the time and then um the, the, the biggest cop for me, my parents finally caved in after I begged them for months to buy me a pair of grape um, Jordan 5s, the ones that were on Fresh Prince. And I took a toothbrush to those every night. I was I was pretty spoiled. Like my parents were middle class, too, like in, in, in Jersey. And um, but they got me the kicks. I, I think I just wore them down. Yeah, my, my toothbrush is key. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I, yeah. I I still use toothbrush. I do today. I do Lysol <laughs> wipes now. I buy Lysol wipes and I wipe them down with the hmm. Lysol wipes. I, I, I use I use crep wipes now. And I do it immediately. Like 
if you if you just when you get home wipe it's done like now i don't need to worry about it i do it immediately um i my first ever we got to get back to the side but my first ever signature i wore my mom down too it was 10th grade i was like ma enough of this payless shit like give me one that i can do it was, yeah that's how you negotiate yeah it was just on, one one and i was straight a student so it's like yo what yep. else can i do right yep. now like i wasn't a good kid but i was a straight a student uh agassiz the first oh, shoe i ever got where the act and i was like and like hot lavas hot lavas yeah, yeah and my friend stood i remember this my friend stood too close like right next to me to look at him I'm like bro you're standing way too close right now. i just got these joints yeah, back up back up stand over you can see them from over there bro um anyways so we like they use the that soul for the easy twos yeah, same yeah. soul yeah so we like customization do we like collaboration or do we think Love that's it. corny do we think brand collaboration is cool? Okay, look at the look at the Air Jordans and the Dior. It's like that's like probably is that like not Nike's like highest? Yeah, but that's resale? primo. I, what I'm talking about is the Hardy sneakers that came out this week. What I'm talking about like that shit came out this week. They limited ran it right, so they are specifically targeting a sneakerhead community, right? They are specifically trying to be cool for lack of a Wait, better. Hardy's and Hardy's and who? I didn't I didn't I didn't peep I this one with Nike. God, I don't want to misquote. No. I don't even know either. So I don't want to misquote. I don't want to misquote. So Nike I, I, and Hardys. Do, does it matter? Like, yes. I mean, no. I mean, does it matter from who are you speaking of, Burton? No, no one mean, knows. Does it matter that? I guess the, my question still remains. Like, do we think brand collaborations that are not pretty? Obviously, if you do a brand collaboration with Christian Dior, that's dope. But okay, let me let me ask you this: When Puma did the brand collaboration with uh ferrari did we think that was cool the jackets were cool but were the sneakers cool because not really not really right like so not I, really I, but I, but I, collaborations I, to us are still super exciting because there's a deal behind every one of these agree agree from the and business so, and, side, we think yeah from the sneakerhead side we like i think this conversation falls into two buckets the entrepreneurs right. and the consumers and i think we are all both of those things right so Fair. from the from i'm with you like we we always want business to happen. It's good for the market. What's good for the market is good for us, right? You guys are going to sell more books this way. People are going to have to read your book because if they do more of these collaborations, I just want to have the book. Like, I, let's start with that. <laughs> we, we, we yeah, I'm, I'm, that. I'm, I'm texting <laughs> K- Kenneth and Jared after this. I'm done with you. Um, we got you. Anyways, so we we think collaborations are good for the market. Yeah, we- but let me just, let's, let's just clarify. Like, it seems like when you're talking about collaborations, you're talking about like a specific type of collab with a brand yeah, not or like a, for not- a consumer product maybe, or a, or, or a non athlete celeb type of a deal. Yes. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. All right. So yeah, like, like Reebok just did Candyland. Like, do I think that that's cool? Not really. Right. Um, but, but, you know, we think of collaborations, much more broadly in the book. So we have athlete collaborations, we have celebrity collaborations, we have musician collaborations, and then we have miscellaneous. And we would group parties into that miscellaneous category. Right. So, so yes, to clarify, I agree with you. Collaborations as a whole is good for the business. And thank you for clarifying that. Uh, I guess what I was specifically asking about is the brand collaborations, um, not the designer ones, not the athlete ones like you guys talked about, but like when these brands get involved, those kooky one, the kooky ones. Yeah. 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 And I, I, again, I guess it falls into two categories. Cause I can see why they're, I, I get why they're doing it. They want a younger audience, right? They want a cool audience, right? Like it sounds corny, but like shit, if the cool kid goes to Hardee's to eat the hamburger, everybody else is going to go to Hardee's to eat the hamburger. Like that's just kind of how it works when you're 15. Um, so I get, I guess I get that. So we, we do like collaborations, all right. Yeah. I mean, it depends. I mean, if it's a dope collab, right. uh, it's fire. But if it's something that's whack, then it's like, okay, you What's know, point? I don't want to doing this. Right. It's still good for the market. If, I mean, it depends. Yeah. I mean, the yeah. way the way I look at it as a capitalist, not as a consumer, as a sneakerhead, shit, I might be able to get into this business. I might be able to convince Fortune 200 marketing company, yo, work with me. I'll, I'll make it work for you and we'll get you a younger demo. Like, you know, I was doing a deal with the container. But if the store. younger demo doesn't think it's cool, does it actually work? Because like you're talking about Hardy and like it does. I mean, it does in some instances. Like my oldest son is has been a Lego head for life, and I gave him the Adidas Lego, you know, collab for. Yeah. He went nuts. I mean, it's so well done too. 
like That's in true. 2006. I mean, I'm I never grown, even heard of that. Club. I'm a grown. Uh, well, they but they also limit it. So this goes back to the exclusivity and the coolness. Like the Hardy sneakers are limited edition. So if you're a sneakerhead or you're trying to flip, you're gonna try and get those joints, That's right? Um, yeah. So like it, it's the same thing. Like I said, with what we did with Wade, we drove down the the availability of the sneaker and it drove up the interest in it, right? For sure. Um, and Kenneth, I had that same like re- response to. When Reebok did, I don't know if you guys remember this. I'm older probably than everybody here, but they did like in 2006, they did a collab with Voltron. And yeah. I was like 27, 28 years old. I'm like, I need these joints. Like, right. Like it, it can pull, it, you know, the emotional pull can be there if it's the right collab. Um, so it could be cool. I mean, yeah, I don't know. I'm, that's fair. I'm I, I have mixed feelings about all of these topics. And uh, I, I feel like we all agree we can go down many, many rabbit holes. POVs. Yeah. Adidas did a uh, Adidas did a Game of Thrones um, collab, and there were some colorways that were fire, and then there were some that were like you know Hard trash. Sure. Yeah, so I mean, sometimes it hits, sometimes it doesn't. Right. By the way, like in the spirit of fast food, Supreme did a collab with Vans and White Castle. Right. Uh, I remember those? Yeah. Yeah. But I think those went over well. If I remember, I thought the public yeah, those are, they're, they're pretty fire. I, I, have, I have to say, you know, the, the logo was all over. The, they were low tops. I think they were skate lows. What, um, what, yeah, what they were pretty clean. On the next frontier, what's the next frontier? Is it NFTs? What sneakers? Is yeah, I was gonna crypto kicks. I was yeah, I was I was gonna ask because we did talk about sneakers as an art, right? And obviously, like the talk of the town right now are NFTs, um, which is basically digital collectible art um, through blockchain and Nike just got crypto. Well, not just, but they patented crypto tech crypto kicks, um, which is blockchain technology that basically allows the sneaker owner to have some sort of digital asset tied to it. Right. Um, So, which is ironic because I actually pitched this exact thing to a player who owns his own sneakers two years ago but timing is everything anyway i digress um so do you guys think that like what what do you guys think of tying sneakers to to the crypto game is it going to significantly increase the value of it will people will it contribute to the hype culture because now it's more so considered art and like you can actually have a a digital footprint of your ownership um curious for thoughts yeah i mean i think it's really cool um you know let's say nike adidas whatever brand it is starts accepting crypto as currency like elon and tesla are doing you know that could be a really cool thing um you know designers can create nfts or brands can create nfts of different sketches or models that could turn into um, you know, physical versions with the token later on. Um, there could just be overall general art related to, to NFTs. I think it can also be great for authentication. You know, if, you, if you're if you using NFT, NFTs and blockchain, you know, you have those tokens. And so, you know, tr- tracking down authentic- authenticity could really be, you know, cool for the consumers and the brands. I think, you know, the sky's the limit. I mean, who knows what can happen from this? Uh, but I think, you know, it will have a huge impact on sneakers. And I think, I think that's what crypto kicks is really all about is the authentic authentication and the blockchain of it. Right. So when you buy through this crypto kicks patented program, you're buying a one of one sneaker, you know, it's, you know, from the manufacturing factory to your doorstep, you can track the whole process and you know, you're getting that product. And then I guess even in the resale market, it would be trackable. Right. And that's the beauty of NFTs. It's like, you know, it's a non fungible token that, you know, it, it gets tracked this one of one item and you know that it can't be replicated, you know, that it can't be bootlegged or counterfeited. And so that's very exciting. And it can also be a game changer for counterfeiters like, you know, that can it can really decimate the counterfeit industry if done properly. 100%. What's also interesting about that is because like if you can track ownership, the previous owner can add so much value to the sneaker, right? Like say it was like, like LeBron played in these or whatever, and then he, and then he sells it. Um, or even someone, even someone. Or he gives them away. 
yeah but like i mean i think the whole point is to is to make money so let's even say like i don't know like an actor or something like wore some sort of sneakers and is like i wore these sneakers in this movie or whatever right. the case may be yeah it actually seems like there's a lot of potential for that oh my god thinking. my head's gonna fucking explode with yeah this we NFT have like shit. two minutes though yeah. let's, <laughs> let's, my head is literally let's gonna be explode. to their time <laughs> um i don't like i I don't even know how to like move on from that. Okay, let's do this. Let's do something fun and not business. Sure. I, and that that's it. You, you're moving to you're moving to a stranded uh, an island. You can't get another sneaker for the rest <laughs> of your fucking life. You get to bring one with you. That's it. You get one. What sneaker you bring with you? You can even be specific on colorway if you wanted to. Yeah, you want to go first. Yeah, I mean, for me, you know, I'm a huge red one guy, but they're just not comfortable. They're from 1985, so I need something new, new age. I love the Wave Runner, the Easy 700. It's super comfortable. They go with pants, jeans. I, I mean, if I'm, uh, they're so comfortable. That's a good answer. Yeah, I mean, you know, if I'm on a island stranded by myself, I don't know what I'd be rocking. So it might just be just sneakers only. I don't know, <laughs> but. <laughs> um, you know, so I would definitely go with the 700s, the way right. Yeah, cool choice, Jared. Great choice. Yeah. <laughs> I would, uh, I'd probably go with the Jordan 1. And uh, I'd probably go with the um, Shattered Backboards just because the upper is so buttery soft and like, you know, it looks good with everything. Um, I mean, the Wave Runner is super fly, but there's something like, I'm just an old school head. I like having my Jordan 1s and I'll sacrifice comfort for freshness. Real sneaker. True sneaker head. Real sneaker. <laughs> you want to go next? Or you want me to go? I mean, I don't honestly like. I wouldn't even want to wear sneakers to. Yeah, I'm wearing. <laughs> to I, yeah, of way. I, I wish I had like yeah, the. I'm wearing chuppels <laughs> the whole time too, right? Like, but, but chuckles. Chuppels. Chuppels are he's, like he's I, that's yeah, yeah. flip flops, the... right? Like, yeah, I know, I know it, I know it very well. Yeah, there's a whole like whole story behind it. I didn't even know the word flip flops or sandals until I was like 19. So I still say chuppels. But go ahead. <laughs> No, uh, yeah, I mean, that that was basically my point, though. I don't, like, my favorite shoes to wear are definitely, like, my Jordan 1s, but after walking in the city in those for, like, after, like, the whole day, it's it's un it's uncomfortable. I might not walk a lot because, like, I would, so I would pick the, J, the J1s, too, and I have really, really flat feet. I do, too. But I, but, I, but I don't find them uncomfortable because I don't tie them up, right? Like, I yeah. just... You're yeah, not I, supposed to. Yeah, you're not you supposed to. So I just you just slip your feet in the whole time. And like I guess I just don't walk that much. Like I guess I'm walking three blocks to the deli. I'm always taking the subway. I'm always if there's a seat on the subway, I'm sitting down. I'm not that guy that stands. I don't even understand. Oh, you don't but here's a trick. Here's a trick. Buy your J ones a half a size up and put some Dr. Scholes in them and and chill. Like you're good. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's actually really good. I I, I wear them, I wear them my actual size that and I just smart. don't tie them up. And I don't know. I don't find them uncomfortable, but if I were going comfort, Air Max, I, I just for differentiation, everybody can't pick AJ ones. That's boring as fuck. I, I I'll go Air Max ninety sevens. So fly and comfort, right? So there you go. Fuck, we did not give any love. to I mean, Adidas. Jared gave fly and <laughs> right. We should give some love to all the other sneaker companies, right? Like I don't know. We just talked about Nike the whole time. Um, and Jared gave love to Adidas. I mean, yeah, you know, oh, yeah, too. shout out, shout out Adidas. I fuck with Easy Heavy too. We, we should talk Lee Ning. We talk Lee Ning. We talk, you know. We should have another conversation, whether it's uh, officially on the pod or officially off the pod, because you guys are dope. This is a dope ass subject. And now right? Burn's gonna be bothering me to talk to you guys. Oh no, you you <laughs> anytime. We already forward their yeah, email. hit us up. Their email, it's That's over. True. Yeah, you forward their email, so now it's over. <laughs> Uh, anytime man but appreciate the time appreciate the candor appreciate like um the knowledge for sure um really rooting for you guys in the book i expect it in the mail next week um and by the way if anybody listening sneakerlaw.com and cop the book ask you, promo yourself promo yourself promo Social where you can find you all that stuff yeah uh, sneakerlaw.com yeah go yeah, ahead sneakerlaw.com instagram handle Sneaker Law, but S N K R L A W. Uh, Twitter as well, Facebook, Sneaker Law. Uh, follow us everywhere. And cool. we'll make sure we get those in print when we actually promo you guys on social as well. Yeah, appreciate you guys.